Perfect. All right, good. So let's get started again. Let me share my screen here. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Let me know if not. Um, so I kind of want to pick up um, uh, from where I left off yesterday. Uh, so I should say also, hi again, hello. <laughs> um, uh, so, so the uh, purpose for today's lecture, I really want to um, focus on dark matter detection. And in particular, as I was um, introducing yesterday, uh, this is sort of one of our big open problems. And um, as I said, I, I'd like to really think about how to detect dark matter kind of over the whole mass range or, or over as much as the mass range as possible. Uh, and remember, I kind of divided it in two for, for masses up here. Um, I said they would act more particle-like and we would have more particle-like detectors. And actually, if there's time at the very end, I'm, I'm in fact going to, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm in fact going to uh, mention that briefly. Um, but uh, I think for most of the lecture today, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this so-called ultralight dark matter below this EV scale, of which axions are, are kind of a prime candidate. And remember, we said that, that sort of phenomenologically, you can, it helps to think of them rather differently than particle. Like, of course, they're particles too. We all know wave-particle duality. It's the same thing. Wave and particle, right? It's all, all captured by quantum mechanics. But um, I at least find it very useful to, to picture these particles as they are quantum mechanically as very extended waves of size, at least their de Broglie wavelength. Um, meaning, remember that since this is the local energy density here in dark matter, uh, that if you take a, a cube of size, the de Broglie wavelength, one over the momentum, one over MV, then you can actually have quite a large number of uh, dark matter particles in that cube. Right, and as the mass gets small, um, this can become a huge phase space occupancy. So they're heavily overlapped, and they act much more like a classical, a classically coherent wave. By the way, when I say coherent, that that word gets abused a lot in physics, used for many many different meanings, unfortunately, or related meanings, but confusing. Um, I don't mean the full quantum coherence by any means. Um, uh, I I simply mean uh, classically coherent, which really just means acting like a, a classical field. Um, as I'll tell you in a second, uh, also it actually means a little more than that. It means even being sort of sharply peaked in frequency space as well. Or at least that's what I mean when I use the word. Okay, um, and then uh, what I want to really, so that was the kind of picture of ultralight dark matter. And then what I want to talk about today is how do we look for it? So, so how can we detect this? Um, How can we do uh, some direct detection experiments of uh, this ultralight dark matter? Um, and remember, I, I sort of hinted to you already that actually that's going to look fairly similar to gravitational wave detection, because what this really is is like some background field uh, propagating through your detector that's very weakly coupled to it. Uh, and hopefully you can all see this uh, screen, sorry. Um, uh, remember my picture from yesterday. Um, uh, this is a, a sort of a picture of ultralight dark matter, like some background, either scalar or vector field um, uh, propagating through the, through the galaxy and uh, through your detector. And looking for that actually is, is in many ways a lot like looking for a background gravitational wave. Okay. Um, so let me go back to my notes here. Okay, so was, was that clear? Are there any questions on that? Any questions from yesterday? That's sort of our starting point for today. So, so it's important to um, uh, be clear on that. Um, are there any questions on that? Either raise your hand or put it in the chat. Okay, good. So let's get started then. Um, so to, to talk about how to do direct detection, sorry, let me get rid of this. To talk about how to do direct detection, um, uh, I actually need to do a little bit of a digression into quantum field theory. Um, uh, some of you may know this already, but I know uh, many of you uh, haven't learned this yet. So, so let me just give you the sort of uh, just the, the pieces of quantum field theory that you need to know. And, and luckily, actually, we can kind of summarize it pretty quickly here. 
Um, so this is a background field. It's, it's you know, it's uh, run by the laws of quantum field theory. And in particular, um, uh, so let's say this is a, a small uh, digression here into quantum field theory. Uh, uh, in particular, any field like this, let's say there is some background scalar axion field. So you should think of, you know, a scalar, and a scalar field, right, is just some, uh, in fact, in case of the axion, some real number, it's a real scalar field, some real number at all points in space. Um, but it's not just a fixed real number. That would be pretty boring, right? That couldn't be dark matter. That's not a degree of freedom. That's not a wave or a particle. Uh, it has to have some dynamics. It has to have the ability to move. And uh, one of the crucial things that determines how it moves, how it, and by move, I really just mean change in time. Uh, uh, one of the crucial things that determines that is for any field, any field has a uh, potential, okay? And if you're not familiar with this from quantum field theory, this can be a little confusing at first. It's a, it's a different sort of different meaning of the word potential than you might be used to. When I say potential, I mean, it's a function of the field. So the simplest will be a quadratic V, which is a function of, and I'm gonna call the scalar field A for axion, okay? And uh, uh, let's say it's just a, a quadratic potential. That's actually the, the simplest potential you can have. So what this means is there's some uh, just constant number out front. Actually, in the case of a quadratic potential, I've written this as m because this will indeed be the mass of the particle. That's not completely obvious. That's one of the things about field theory you just have to accept for now if you haven't learned it yet. Um, uh, but, but what does this mean? I've plotted this as a function of a, not of position, right? Not of x. Uh, what this means is that um, the, this is how much potential energy is carried by a chunk of scalar field that has, let's say, this value. So if the scalar field has this value, then you trace it up over here. This tells you how much potential energy that scalar field is carrying merely as a function of, of having that value. It's the field energy. Okay, um, it's, it's maybe a little bit like an electric field or something carrying uh, E squared of energy in it, right? E squared of energy density. I should say this is the energy density. Um, okay, uh, but also just like a, a potential in uh, real space, if this was a function of x and you had a, a ball rolling in this potential, just like that, um, this potential will also tell you how the field moves. So for example, if I start the field off with, with this value here, uh, we might usually draw a little dot there on the potential, it will do exactly what you expect it to do, namely it'll roll down this potential. What that means is the field value everywhere in space starts, let's say at this value, maybe five GeV or whatever is the field value, and then it begins to decrease because of the potential, okay? Um, in fact, uh, I said the potential tells you the um, energy density of the field. Actually, that's not quite right. The total energy density is, of course, you're probably not too surprised, the sum of a kinetic energy density and a potential energy density. Okay. So here is the total energy density for some scalar field like our axion. And it'll be the sum of these two contributions, whatever this function gives you, whatever the value of your scalar field is, let's say everywhere in the universe or in some big region of the universe, some big chunk of the universe. If it has this value, then it will have this energy density in potential energy and also one half a dot squared, however fast that scalar field is changing. So it's just to be clear, it's a little confusing. We call this kinetic energy density. The scalar field doesn't actually have to be moving in space. In fact, most of our picture for ultralight dark matter, um, we don't even need it to be moving. Dark matter is moving, but remember I said yesterday, it's moving kind of slowly. In fact, I think I have it here. It's moving at this rather slow velocity of 10 to the minus three, slow compared to the speed of light, which means um, it's actually why I've neglected any, any uh, spatial derivative terms in the kinetic energy here for, this, for now. And I've only put these time derivative terms. Dominantly, the kinetic energy is determined just by the time derivative um, meaning just how much that value of the scalar field everywhere in the universe is changing in time. So think of a uniform scalar field at some value, and then that value slowly, let's say, dropping in time, right? So as this, as this field rolls down its potential. And you can see, of course, maybe if I start at the top here, it starts all potential energy in that chunk of space. Uh, but as it rolls down, when the field value passes through zero, there is no potential energy anymore in that chunk of space. It's all become kinetic energy. And then you're maybe not too surprised that I'm, I'm not even writing down the equations of motion for you. You just kind of have to uh, take my word for it with this picture. But maybe you're not too surprised that if you solve the equations of motion for a scalar field propagated with just a mass term, okay, so just a, a free scalar field that isn't interacting with anything, just has a mass, the particle has a mass, 
in quantum field theory, it looks like it has a potential like this. And then the answer to the equation of motion is that the scalar field is a function of position and time everywhere in space uh, just goes like some cosine. It's some amplitude, some fixed constant amplitude A naught, maybe this amplitude out here, uh, A naught, and oscillating with frequency equal to the mass, okay? And for right now, I'm pretending that actually the dark matter field is completely homogeneous. Actually, as I kind of showed you on that little animation that I was just showing you on the slide, it will have some spatial gradients, and we'll get to that in a second. But for right now, yeah, those spatial gradients are small. So for right now, you should just imagine it being some completely homogeneous scalar field filling all space around the Earth, around my detector. And that the whole value of that scalar field is the same everywhere around me is dropping into or is oscillating in time, really, with frequency equal to the mass. And that's the background signal that I'm looking for. That's the background field that I'm looking for. OK, that was uh, sort of everything you needed to know from quantum field theory <laughs> in a nutshell. Uh, very quick. Obviously, I can't really summarize all the details um, in, in less than you know a year's worth of work or something, a year's worth of class. So, But, but was that clear? Are there quite or clear enough? Are there questions on that? Because that's, that's pretty important. That'll be the basis for sort of everything that I'm about to do. So just raise your hand or type in the chat. <clears throat> OK. I don't see any, so I'll go on. Um, sorry, okay. Uh, so, all right, now we know a little something about how uh, the dark matter field works as a field. Now, to figure out how to detect it, we need to figure out how big it is, okay, first. All right, um, uh, so how big? is this dark matter field, all right? Um, right, I need to know that. In particular, what I really mean is how big is this amplitude A naught, for example, since I told you the dark matter field will look like this locally around us. And, and again, I mean, how big is it right around us? Because I'm interested in direct detection. So I'm interested in seeing it. Um, uh, so actually, I want you to answer this question, OK? So maybe get out a little uh, pencil and paper or something, just as a practice. And I'm going to give you a couple minutes to think about this. Um, uh, given what I've told you so far, uh, and remember in particular, um, I told you the uh, energy density of dark matter, where to go, here it is, uh, and whichever units you like, right? Um, and remember, I'm working in these h-bar equals c equals one units. Uh, so here's the, here's the uh, energy per volume of the dark matter. Uh, and I've told you uh, how much energy density the field carries. So now I just want you to figure out what is this value of A naught and uh, uh, get, try it numerically also, you know, find an analytic expression for it, but also uh, try it, uh, calculate a numeric, new, sorry, <laughs> numerically, can't write and talk at the same time, uh, do uh, two cases. Uh, if the mass is around one EV, remember that's the kind of upper edge of this ultralight range, upper edge of where you can even treat it as a field at all, as a classical field. And let's say at the lower edge, so you'll have it bracketed, okay? 10 to the minus 22 EV. Okay, um, is, first, is that question that I'm asking you to calculate, is that clear? Any questions on that? Okay, so so I, we won't go to breakout rooms because it, it takes too much time. Um, uh, but um, I, I'm hoping you can each try it just wherever you are. Um, try writing it down on a on a piece of paper. See if you can find the answer. Um, uh, and I'll give you just a couple minutes. And of course, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. If you have any questions about this, or if something isn't clear, or type it in the chat or something. Maybe I should scroll up so you can still see the formulae. Um, well, there's the energy density of the field. And recall the energy density of dark matter is roughly this 0.04 EV 
to the fourth. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm not in the interest of time. I'm not really going to give you enough time to, to think about it uh, for too long. Um, so no worries if you didn't get a chance to solve it. Um, especially I know for those of you who haven't seen quantum field theory before, this is really trying to just sort of get you used to the language um, that we're going to be using. Um, okay, but so, uh, but I just wanted you to think about it a little bit. So it'd be more clear when hopefully more clear when I talked about it, um, when I give you the answer here. Uh, so how big is this field? Well, we said um, the local energy density contained in this dark matter field is this value here, right? And as a function of the value of the field, this is the energy density contained in the field. So I can just equate those two. I can just say uh, 0.04 EV to the fourth should be equal to, uh, and, and by the way, I'm dropping plenty of order one constants throughout these lectures. That's why I keep writing these twiddles. <laughs> this is just sort of for pedagogy, trying to keep things simple. Um, uh, should be equal to this value here. Actually, if I really just want to know the amplitude of the field, right? I want to know this is a simple harmonic oscillator. It's it's wiggling back and forth in its quadratic potential. Uh, I can say right at the edge of the oscillation, right? Where it's it's gone all the way up, it's it's stopped and it's about to come back down. Right there, the kinetic energy is zero. So I don't even need to use that term. And the potential energy is just uh, m squared a naught squared. Uh, so I'll just equate this to m squared a naught squared, and that'll tell me the amplitude a naught. Okay, so we can solve for that. But first, is that clear? Are, are there questions on that? Which are really questions on on kind of what I mean by this by this field? Okay. Okay. Um, so if you just calculate this, then you find that a is of course 0.04 eV squared over m. And then if you do it numerically for these two values I gave you, I found about a milli eV uh, if uh, m was around one eV. And uh, sorry, this is, let me try to write that a little bit better. And I found around 10 to the 19 eV, which is 10 to the 10 GeV, if M was on the left edge around 10 to the minus 22 EV. So for the, for the heaviest masses, you can see where it's kind of dissolving into not being a classical field anymore at all. It also has a very low field value. In some cases, that's gonna make it harder to see, although, although that's really a generalization that depends on the experiment very much and on what signal you're looking for. Um, but at the lowest mass edge, at this ultralight edge, often the so-called fuzzy dark matter edge, where the dark matter is about the size of a dwarf galaxy in, in Compton wavelength, in De Broglie wavelength, uh, then it actually has a very large field value and a, an extremely large field value for the axion field. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? All right. So I'm going to go on now and, and try to build on this. Now that we know how big the dark matter field is, now I want to ask, all right, how do we go looking for this? How can we detect it? 
Um, and in particular, uh, to detect it, of course, I need to know not just how big it is, but also how strongly it couples to me, right? How strongly it couples to any um, experiment that we might come up with on the Earth here. Now is where we get into the sort of plethora of possibilities. Um, there's several different ways the dark matter could couple to us. Actually, not as many as you might think. It's not a completely open game. The, the laws of quantum field theory do restrict it. Actually, I'm going to show you a sort of complete list of the leading order couplings um, a little bit later this lecture. But for now, I kind of want to just start by going through one or two examples, OK, and, and show you specific examples so you understand what it means, how it couples, and how we can look for it. Ah, oh, great. And I see a question in the chat, actually. Salvatore, can you um, unmute yourself, or do I need to do that? If I need to do it, let me figure out how to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm perfect. Here. Yes, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I was I was thinking about you know according to the expansion theory of the universe and according to your calculation about you know the mass, the the potential, and the density of the dark matter. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to have dark matter as you know uh, and uh, an op opposite element to the gravity of the space, like, you know, like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so works. good. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great question, actually. And this is also one of the, I mean, so one of the many beautiful and important things about quantum field theory that I, you know, that there's a lot about field theory that I, of course, can't teach you in one lecture, but, but this is a great question. This is a crucial one. Um, uh, so absolutely, so I've given you the energy density, but you're absolutely right. In general relativity, if, if you write down um, how this field acts in GR, in, in let's say an expanding universe, in an FRW universe, or how it, in general a scalar field acts, it actually has a huge range of possible behaviors. Okay, it's very interesting. In fact, <laughs> if you let me pick um, any shape potential I want, if you let me draw whatever crazy potential I want here, okay, I can actually cause this scalar field to reproduce any equation of state I want. Okay, so you, so um, those of you who've taken some general relativity, you may remember that the equation of state of the matter filling your FRW universe determines things like does it act like matter or does it act like radiation or does it act like dark energy and, and rip the universe apart, right? Um, they're all very different. Um, does it act like inflation, et cetera? Um, uh, the equation of state, if you like, in, in an expanding universe just tells you as the universe expands, what does this thing do? And that's totally not clear from what I've told you so far. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's an extra piece of the story that one has to calculate by actually, by actually putting the scalar field equations in a, an expanding universe background and, and checking out what they do. Uh, that's a beautiful story. I, I strongly recommend you all check it out. Um, I'll just, I don't have time, of course, to, to prove this to you. So I'll just tell you the answer. But, but it's a great question. Um, uh, and, and actually, there's some, there's some beautiful, simple, under, simple cases that we can understand. So first, let me do first this dark matter case, okay, where it's just rolling back and forth in this quadratic potential. It's actually, I mean, if you think about it, it's, and this is maybe one of the reasons you're asking your question, it's totally not obvious why am I calling this matter, right? I mean, it's a completely homogeneous field. That's not, that's not necessarily your first picture of dark matter, right? <laughs> you, you probably thought about particles zipping around and, and cold stuff that's moving non-relativistically and collapsing under gravity and forming clumps yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It turns out, and this is totally not obvious, but it turns out that is how this acts. Okay, you can you can show that in fact, on an expanding universe, this um, oscillating cosine will its amplitude will damp as the as the scale factor expands. It will drop just like it should to be matter. Okay, uh, uh, it'll drop like scale factor cubed. Okay, I don't want to say a because I'm using that for the accent, but it'll it'll drop like scale factor cubed. The energy density in the scalar field will drop like scale factor cubed. That is totally not obvious, but this thing will redshift like matter, and in fact, it will clump like matter. So you know, it walks like a duck, it, it, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, uh, this really is a bunch of very cold particles. In fact, as I'll explain in a second, this is a bunch of particles who have zero momentum at all. They're just sitting there. Any little density of homogeneities, they would love to collapse to form galaxies. So this thing gravitates like a bunch of really cold particles. So that will tend to um, slow down the expansion rate of the universe, or or clump extra density and homogeneities will tend to clump into galaxies. Um, but if I don't have this potential, if I have something different, then it can act totally differently. For example, if it was just stuck in a potential minimum at some non-zero height, and it was just sitting there at the bottom of the minimum, that would be a cosmological constant. That would be a dark energy that would rip the universe apart. So if it, that would be something that's all potential energy and no kinetic, okay? And that will, that will serve to rip the universe apart. 
right? It's not at all obvious by staring at these things that this one's going to act like matter. <laughs> this cosine is going to act like matter and pull in the universe. And so just basically, the it's basically, it's like a skeleton for the universe, but uh, the nature is not, it's not well known, like, it's like matter or energy, right? Yeah, or even something weirder, if I draw a crazy potential, I can get it to actually mock up any W, any equation of state, it turns out. Um, Thank you so much. Um, yeah, great question. And, and so it's totally not, and that's really not obvious from what I've told you so far. So that, that's a great question. Um, and you just have to take my word for it. Uh, by the way, as a, this is a, a, a tangent, which I won't really need, but um, uh, uh, in case you're curious, um, the, uh, the equation of state of a scalar field uh, goes like um, uh, kinetic minus potential over kinetic plus potential. Um, uh, so that, that, that is how you can calculate what it's acting like. And, and it can in fact take on almost any value depending on what the potential is and, and how the field rolls in that potential. Um, okay, let me get rid of that though, because it's not, we won't need it. But yes, perfect, great question. Any other questions or, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, uh, okay, great. So we have this field. I've asserted for you that it's acting like matter and we know how big it is. Here are its values. Um, so we know what it's doing. How does it couple to us, right? How can we look for it? And like I said, there's a bunch of possible couplings. I'll show you them all in a second. Let me just start with one, okay? As a, as a simple case and kind of walk you through what it does. And that'll give you a better idea of, of how I'm thinking about detection here. So for example, uh, the dark matter can couple to the electron. And in fact, it has a couple different couplings to the electron. I'll pick one where it's coupling, we say, to the electron mass, okay? And if you speak quantum field theory, I'll write the Lagrangian term for you. Uh, although if you don't, I'll interpret it for you. Or actually, I should have written this, I guess, um, let me not call it a Lagrangian. Let me call it a potential term. So, so this would be an extra potential term. The dark matter always has this um, uh, m squared a squared term because it needs to have a mass. It's a massive particle. It needs to have a mass to be cold dark matter, to be non-relativistic, right? So it always has this term. There are also other terms in the potential of QFT. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about everything. But if I add one more term here to this potential, so this potential includes this one extra term, which couples the scalar dark matter, the axion, to the electron, which I've written as E. Okay, and this is really a spinner if you if you speak that language. And I put now some g out front, which is a um, dimensionful constant, a constant of nature, which tells you how strongly it couples. So of course this g could be zero, and then we'd be out of luck, at least for looking for this coupling, for looking for the dark matter this way. <laughs> that would be unfortunate, right? Um, but because this is an allowed coupling for many types of scalar dark matter, it's the usual um, uh, sort of belief in physics. There's no particular reason to believe this is exactly zero. That would be an, actually an infinite fine tuning, an extreme fine tuning. This might be a small number. We kind of know it has to be small from our, our current experimental test, um, but there's no particular reason for it to be exactly zero. Um, uh, oh, great. And actually there's a, there's a comment in the chat by Ibrahim who, who has a, you can check it out. I have a paper to, um, uh, where you can learn more about those calculations I was just talking about. So perfect, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, uh, okay, so uh, uh, what does this kind of extra term in the potential do now? Notice there's a potential energy, but it's coupling two different things. It's coupling the dark matter to the electrons. So what is this? Again, if, if um, once you learn quantum field theory, you'll, you'll be able to recognize this, but so now you just have to accept, let me tell you the answer. Uh, what this does is this potential term, you might, even, you might even believe it, this quadratic term in the electron is a mass for the electron. Okay, and everything that comes out front here uh, gives you an extra modification to the electron mass. So there'd also be some other term that looks like this that just has the normal electron mass. And then this is some extra little bit that's proportional with the dark matter. So that's kind of weird, right? What does that mean? What that means is the following. Uh, the mass of an electron then is equal to, well, the 511 keV that people have measured so many years ago for the mass of an electron, okay? Uh, but then plus this extra little contribution, some small coupling, some very tiny number, GE, times this axion field, right? 
And look, you can evaluate this because you know how big the axion field is, the, this dark matter field is, as a function of the mass, at least if it makes up all of the dark matter. OK. Um, uh, now, you might immediately say, wait, wait, you know, the electron is something we measured for a long time. How do I, how do I uh, possibly think it's safe to add some extra things to it? A couple of reasons. One, this will be a small number, as I'm about to have you um, check. Uh, but two, also think about what this really means. So, so then this is the next question I want you to just sit for a minute and think about. Um, imagine, okay, uh, if I have a lab experiment and I have an electron sitting in my lab and I'm gonna very carefully watch it, okay? We could do this by trapping an electron. Actually, we do this every time we look at an atom, like an atomic clock. Uh, that's a very careful measure of electrons property, as I'll tell you in just a second. Let's say I have an electron and I, and I watch, um, I have a lab experiment where I watch my electron bathed in this background dark matter field. Okay, what do I see? What happens to the electron? Um, and in particular, um, uh, what can I look for? So, so this is a question for you. Take just like a minute and think about this. Um, and then I'll, I'll come in and tell you how we're going to use this, what, what we're going to see. And, and is that clear? Any questions on this, I should say? Raise your hand or put it in chat. OK. Take a minute and think about that. Okay, so I hope you had a chance just to think about it. Again, um, I don't actually, if you haven't seen this stuff before much, if you're not familiar with this language, I don't actually expect you to solve it in the little bits of time I give you, but just to think about it. Um, uh, so, so what's the answer? What do I see? Uh, well, I, if, I, if I very carefully watch my electron, I should see its mass, right? But I should see its mass affected by the value of the background axion field. And remember, what is that axion field doing? Well, it's oscillating in time with frequency, the mass of the dark matter, right? So what I should see then is that the physical mass, the physically observed mass of an electron is a constant average, 511 keV, but plus some oscillating piece, A naught cosine mt, where this m is the mass of the dark matter, right? And uh, we know this A naught, we know the amplitude here. In just a second, I'll have you evaluate this numerically to see how big it is, okay? But let's even just think about this right now. Uh, this is an oscillating electron mass oscillating with uh, frequency equal to M, the mass of the dark matter, okay? Uh, so imagine if I'm watching the electron mass, it's, it's stuck here averaging at 511 kV. In fact, if I do an experiment which averages over time scales very long compared to this frequency, I wouldn't even see this at all, right? So that's one answer to why I might not have seen this yet. How can I possibly say that the electron, a particle we've known and loved for 100 years, um, uh, has, a, has an extra component, has an extra oscillating mass? That's crazy, right? Uh, but no, at least if this frequency was fast enough, right? Maybe every experiment I've done to measure the electron mass um, lasts, you know, a millisecond or something. And if this frequency was much faster than, uh, than that, than kilohertz, uh, maybe I wouldn't see it. 
by the way, um, or of course, the other option is that this amplitude is very small. In, in fact, that both can be true, as we'll see in just a second. Um, uh, but, but by the way, this also should make us now go back and ask, ah, th this is in fact going to be the generic signature of this dark matter, right? I said, this was a very general statement. This is what dark matter looks like. The background dark matter field looks like in our lab. It's some oscillating field oscillating with its frequency equal to the mass. This is something like this is always what we're going to be looking for in these experiments. Some, some property or some, um, thing we can measure some small signal oscillating with a very particular frequency. Now I think you start to see um, why I really said it was like a gravitational wave detection, right? There, you're always looking for some, some oscillating signal. Here, in fact, the signal is fixed to be the mass of the dark matter sort of forever. The frequency is fixed forever. So it's one uh, sort of monotone forever. Um, and, and in many ways, an even easier signal to see. You don't need a, a waveform that you've already calculated to go looking for. Um, uh, uh, now, very importantly, though, we have to ask, what are these frequencies? So now let me go back up here and label them for you. Uh, around an EV, an electron volt, that is about optical light, right? So that's about an optical frequency. Actually, one EV about is, an opti is about an optical frequency of 10 to the 15 hertz or so. That's about the highest frequencies that we're good at playing with in the lab, right? Opt we can certainly mess with things at optical frequency, but Certainly, it's, it's difficult to make uh, lab experiments that are really much higher frequency than that. And sort of coincidentally, all the way down to 10 to the minus 22 EV, uh, this turns out to be about um, an inverse year in frequency, OK? So these are, uh, it's a huge range, but these are really nicely human frequency scales, <laughs> right? These are scales we can probe in the lab. You can maybe get all the way up to energy uh, frequencies about that, or, or maybe a little less with lab experiments we can make, with high precision lab experiments. And um, uh, you know, a grad student is willing to wait maybe a whole couple of years to, to write their PhD thesis, right? <laughs> to, to sit in the lab and, and look for the dark matter to oscillate a couple of times. But if this had been you know, a millennia, we'd have been out of luck. <laughs> that would have been unfortunate, right? But so, so we really got sort of lucky that these are kind of human frequencies. Is that clear? That's kind of a crucial point for everything that comes next. Are there, are there questions on that? All right, great. So that was kind of a, a cool accident. Um, now, uh, back to what we're saying. Uh, so this is the kind of signal we're going to be looking for. And in particular, if we're looking for, if we're, if we're doing this particular coupling here of the dark matter to the electron mass, and we're looking for an oscillating electron mass, how can we, how can we look for that? Well, um, first, let's say, how big is it? OK, so I want you to now try calculating that. Um, <clears throat> But for that, I do have to tell you one more thing, which is uh, there are, of course, bounds on how strong this GE can be. And in fact, one of the things they come from uh, is, uh, now let me go into a little bit of, of uh, sort of uh, quantum field theory language. If you haven't seen it before, just sort of bear with me and, and accept what I'm saying. Um, this coupling is a coupling of this new scalar boson to the electron. Even if the scalar wasn't dark matter at all, uh, it will mediate a new force in the lab, a new long range force, okay? Simply by exchange of virtual quanta of this boson. The Feynman diagram, of course, would be something like this. Here's the electron, here's the axion. If you, if you speak Feynman diagrams, uh, this gives you a new force from the axion between two electrons, okay? Actually be a sort of Coulomb, one over R squared like or, or Newtonian gravity like force. Um, uh, people can look for that, right? There are famous experiments looking for violations of the equivalence principle and new fifth forces in the lab and everything. And those experiments, among other things, set bounds on the strength of this coupling. So looking for the axiom, not even as dark matter, just to be there at all in the, in the theory and have this kind of coupling. Um, that sets a bound and the current experimental bound uh, on uh, GE, I translated into this units I'm using here, is about, and I'll give it to you in a bit of a funny form because it's useful in this form, 511 keV over, sorry, over uh, 10 to the 30 eV, okay? So it's actually a dimensionless number, but I gave it to you in this form because this is a little more easy to work with in this form. Um, so imagine if uh, the coupling GE is at this upper bound allowed by experiment, 
Um, uh, how much does the electron mass change? What is the signal you see? How much does it oscillate? So, so take just a minute and calculate that. And remember, this is the largest the signal could be. And of course, if there are any questions, please ask. Oh, yes, Leonardo, you have a hand up. Um, yes, go ahead. So, uh, my question is, shouldn't uh, we also be told that what uh, dark matter mass uh, we're interested? Or oh, very good. Thank you. Yes. Um, do it. Maybe do it first. Just as the general formula. How about as a function of mass? And then why don't you plug in? Great question. Why don't you plug in um, also those two masses, the two edges of the range, EV and 10 to the minus 22 EV. Thank you. Perfect. Did that answer the question? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, in order to keep us moving along, I won't necessarily really give you enough time, um, but let me go over it. Hopefully you had a chance at least to think about it. All right, so, so I wanna know essentially how big is this signal? This is my signal of dark matter, right? How big is this term here? I'll call that term delta me, the change in the electron mass, uh, which is this coupling times the dark matter field, okay? In size and magnitude, oscillating of course like cosine mt. Um, and I said this coupling, uh, GE, is this value here, 511 kV over 10 to the 30 eV. Uh, I gave it to you that way because we, that way we can pull out the, current, the actual sort of average mass of the electron, 511 kV, right? Uh, and just um, write it as the field value here for um, A naught, right? Over this uh, 10 to the 30 eV, okay? Uh, if I do that, I find, so this is, uh, I should say, this is, uh, a, whoops, oops, times A naught over 10 to the 30 EV. And if I then plug in those A naughts from above, you find that this is 511 kV, the electron mass, times 10 to the minus 33 <laughs> times EV over M, okay? Or in other words, uh, uh, the fractional change in the electron mass, delta me over delta me, fractionally how much it varies, is 10 to the minus 33 if the mass of the dark matter is at that upper edge around an electron volt, but it does get a whole lot bigger uh, at all the way up to 10 to the minus 11 if the mass is at the very left edge, the lightest possible mass, 10 to the minus 22 eV. Okay, so first, is that clear how I got that? Are there questions on this, on how I got this? Okay, um, and then uh, what does this mean? Well, boy, look at that. <laughs> Those are some small numbers. I mean, uh, that one looks impossible, right? I would bet. And 10 to the minus 11 is pretty small. We do measure some things in physics to that accuracy. Um, so it might be possible. So worth, worth thinking about. Um, oh, and there's a um, question, actually. Uh, can you unmute yourself or do I need to unmute you? Question in the chat. See, si. so you took the case where A is equal to 10 to the power minus three and not minus 19, right? Um, to calculate I the, 
uh, the case where a oh you mean uh, this one right this one yeah yeah good so so for for m is an electron volt I took a is ten to the minus three eV exactly um and and that gave me this uh, extremely small number because ten to the minus three eV over ten to the thirty was uh, ten to the minus thirty three but look even if I take ten to the nineteen which is what which is the case for m is ten to the minus twenty two eV it's gonna be even worse. 10 to the nineteen. Oh, sorry, what'd you say? Oh, it's gonna be worse when we took the, the case when A is equal to tens to the to the power minus 19. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, oh, good. This is, this is, this one is um, 10 to the plus 19, sorry. sorry oh, I plus go. 19, yeah, I didn't yeah. see. Okay. <laughs> sorry, so, so it does get a lot better. Um, uh, believe me, I've, I've, uh, I've missed the sign in the exponent more times than you can, you can, you can see the huge exponents floating around. I sometimes, when I do these calculations, uh, when I'm doing my research, I'll come out with a crazy answer, and you never know whether the crazy answer is because the true answer is crazy or because I, I accidentally flipped the sign. Um, but but look, right, even plus 19 is not really enough to turn this into a large signal because I'm divided by this gigantic 10 to the 30 EV. Right, <laughs> um, okay. Perfect, right. yeah, Thanks. good. That answered the question, good. Um, so even there, I still get this very small 10 to the minus 11. Um, uh, so that, that means, in other words, the electron mass is wiggling in time, right, back and forth with this frequency, but it's only even, even at, at these lowest masses, which would be the lowest frequencies, remember, uh, this is also a frequency, this is equivalent to a frequency uh, of about once per year. So the electron mass actually only wiggles back and forth once per year, whereas this is a frequency of 10 to the 15 times per second, <laughs> so it would wiggle back and forth very fast, but in this case with an extremely low amplitude. Here, um, even at our largest amplitude, it would only be in the 11th digit on the electron mass that it would change. <laughs> so you can imagine you have to measure very precisely. Um, yeah, great, great question. Is, is that clear? Or are there more questions on that? Okay, but of course, um, if you, if you uh, do this calculation, you say, boy, that, that looks really small, but Humanity has gotten good at, at uh, doing some really high precision technology, right? Um, in particular, these quantum sensors we've been talking about are very high precision. Um, and in fact, let's see if I can do this here. Come on. Here we go. If I can back it up. Sorry, one second. Um, to my, where was it? Here we go. Uh, remember uh, what I showed you uh, yesterday. Look. Look at the look at the y-axis of this, right? Ten to the minus eleven. That's that's trivial. <laughs> that's that's nineteen sixties technology, actually, right? Uh, and in fact, if you oscillate the electron mass, if you change the electron mass, exactly what you're changing, you know, think think about the hydrogen atom, right? You've calculated the hydrogen atom. The energy splittings in the hydrogen atom are all set by me by the mass of the electron, right? If I change the electron mass, I change the energy splittings in all atoms. Every atom that's sitting here bathed in this background dark matter would have its energy splittings oscillating just a little bit, but oscillating. But you know, if they're oscillating in the 11th digit, remember the energy splitting of an atom, that's what an atomic clock is really good at measuring, right? That's what we use. That phase shift was delta E times T, right? Remember that from yesterday. Um, so look, actually 10 to minus 11 is, is nothing for an atomic clock. They're much better now. Actually, by the way, there's even dots further down. There's, we're down to 10 to the minus 19 practically by now. Um, so that should make you excited, right? That, that right there is why, ah, shoot. Um, that right there is why we, uh, I'm just gonna have to go through this. Uh, why we um, uh, talk about quantum technologies for looking for dark matter um, uh, and gravitational waves and everything like that. Um, so uh, let me, um, uh, skip ahead here. Um, uh, what we can do then, and remember I, I told you yesterday uh, that uh, we made this uh, gravity wave detector using atomic clocks, right? By taking two atomic clocks, essentially, atom interferometers, but we're acting like a lot like atomic clocks and putting them on the, on the ends of a long laser baseline and timing the, the travel of the light across, right? That made a gravity wave detector. Well, look, it also now makes a dark matter detector. Okay, do you see that? Um, because uh, the, um, uh, the, the oscillating dark matter field is gonna cause the energy splitting in the atom to vary, 
which is going to vary the phase shift in an atomic clock in the atom interferometer, right? Of course, to see this, I have to have something to compare it to, right? I, if I don't already have a really good clock to compare it to, I, I don't know. I, I don't know, you know, in my head that it's buried in the 11th digit. So I have to compare two clocks, right? Of course, if the two clocks were the exact same clock and they were right next to each other, they would vary the exact same way. So although the energy levels would be varying, I wouldn't see it in my experiment, right? But if I take those two clocks very far apart, like we are, would do for a gravitational wave detector anyway, like we are doing for a gravitational wave detector, then I can see it, right? Because as the light is traveling across the detector, um, uh, in fact, really, as I'm letting those atoms sit uh, and I accumulate phase during the atom interferometer, during the atomic clock, as the time changes, the dark matter field changes, okay? And I'm, I'm sensitive to that. I see that in comparing the two clocks. Um, uh, so you can look for this oscillation of fundamental constants. By the way, I did this example with the electron mass, but it's really any fundamental constant. It could be alpha, the fine structure constant that's varying, right? Anything that enters the energy levels of an atom, which actually at high enough order is almost anything, you can see this way. Uh, so, so if it's causing this energy splitting, let's say between the two clock states, the metastable uh, states and strontium to oscillate, then we can see it by comparing these two clocks in the gravitational wave detector, okay? And uh, perhaps you're not surprised that here's a plot of the sensitivity. This y-axis is essentially that G parameter I was just telling you. Uh, sorry, it's not in the same units. It's because in this paper, we, we used a different thing, which is a little less pedagogically useful. But just imagine this translates into the G parameter. And in fact, you can, you can fix it here because this gray line, this EP stands for equivalence principle. That is that bound that I told you. That is that um, upper bound on GE, on that coupling I was just giving you, okay, is set by those forces. So this is the actual picture. This is versus the mass of the dark matter or equivalently the frequency of the dark matter. And, and perhaps you're not surprised that our dark matter detectors, our gravity wave detectors, sorry, like Magus 100 here or future space-based and things like that detectors, they're looking at exactly the same frequency band for dark matter, that's where they're sensitive, the same frequency band where they were sensitive for gravitational waves, right? It's exactly the same frequency band, of course, for the, for the same reason this ultralight dark matter field is really looking kind of a lot like a gravitational wave. <laughs> Although it wouldn't have a tensor polarization, it's not stretching and squeezing, right? It, it acts uniformly no matter the direction of your detector, and that's a way to tell it apart. But the signal is, is similar and can absolutely be looked for with the exact same hardware actually running in the exact same detection mode even. Um, okay, so that's, that's another uh, a sort of really cool reason to go building these kind of dark matter detectors and, and somewhat special actually to these atomic detectors. Um, uh, there are things that, uh, the, there are kinds of dark matter that LIGO can look for, um, uh, but not this, not this kind. Um, any questions on this? Is, is that clear? Please, yes, uh, Leonardo. Uh, yes, so I have a question on this plot. So I see mm -hmm. there's a dotted line called natural DME. Uh, at, at what energy scale uh, is uh, the, the uh, natural uh, statement uh, true? Good, very good, good question. So, so let me just say for everyone, for people who might not be familiar with this, that particular coupling that I was talking about will actually, through quantum loop corrections and quantum field theory, this is not obvious, if you haven't seen it before, will actually induce a, um, an extra contribution to the mass of the dark matter itself. So wherever you are on the y-axis here, whatever value of your coupling it is, it will tend to push you out to some value of the mass. And so you'd want to be beyond that value to heavier masses, meaning you want to get below this naturalness line. OK, now, as we were discussing yesterday, actually, I, I think it's well worth looking even in regions that are a little bit tuned up here. Um, but this is evaluated for around the um, TEV scale or so. OK, uh, so so uh, let me well, that's that's for the experts in the audience to answer your question. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, good. And then actually, that's one of the reasons, although I won't talk too much about it, that we also like to consider other couplings for the dark matter that don't have this um, naturalness issue. And I'll be getting to those in just a second. This was sort of the easiest one to start with because it's kind of the easier one to explain. Um, good question. Any other questions on this? On, on, so this is kind of your first example of how we can look for ultralight dark matter with a high precision quantum technology. High precision, in this case, atomic sensor, although there are many other possible um, detection methods too. Can I ask a question? Please, yeah. Yeah, so, so we're trying to sense uh, oscillations um, so if we're successful, how do, do we know that that could be attributed to dark matter and not something else? 
Yeah, great question. So, and that's always a, a sort of the, the key question for any of these high precision experiments. And, and you could ask it about dark, about gravitational waves too, for sure, right? And there's a lot of noise. So, you know, the first answer is that like, you know, the same thing that you did in LIGO or that the people who are building these atomic clocks, even just to measure time, have had to do over the decades. You work crazy hard <laughs> to try to figure out, identify, isolate, and remove every background coming from your lab, <laughs> right? Um, uh, it's sort of sort of insane. Um, so there, there are many fantastic stories of, uh, of crazy backgrounds that, that people work hard to eliminate. Um, uh, for atomic clocks, for example, uh, uh, things like um, uh, uh, temperature gradients uh, te or, or temperature changes from the environment, which can influence the atoms. Um, if the atoms are too dense and they're colliding, that makes some collisional phase shifts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you go through a very long list, and I haven't done any of that for you, but that's kind of the crucial behind the scenes work that takes um, years and lots of careful thinking. Um, and, and, it's, and it's something we did, for example, when thinking about gravitational waves, and, and this is really a very similar signal, so we, we sort of knew it had the same answer. We went through and thought about lots of different possible backgrounds, all the things that could be striking the atom or causing the atom to oscillate. Remember I talked about like gravity gradient noise and things like that. Um, uh, so I've sort of cut these curves off actually where that would come in. Um, so it's a key question, and, and, and that's really what I'm not actually telling you, <laughs> but is the behind the scenes work. Um, and, and we write in the papers, for example. And that's what you want to do for any of these dark matter experiments. You know, just like they do for a CDMS or LZ, any of these WIMP detection experiments, right? They think really carefully about all the sources of background radiation that could be coming in and try to isolate them. Um, uh, so that's sort of your first answer. But then, of course, there's a, imagine you've done all that and you, and you start to see a signal and you really just can't remove it, right? And it's, it's, it's in your experiment and it looks good. There's a lot of checks you can do. So first of all, the dark matter is always there. Um, it won't come and go like many other noise sources do. So you should always be seeing it. So you can all do all your jackknife tests, okay? Which are excellent in eliminating a lot of backgrounds and, and give you a lot more confidence in your signal. Second of all, it's everywhere. In fact, these, this is long wavelength. These, these wavelengths are light seconds, right? You can see the periods are seconds. So I should definitely be able to, if, if, if someone thinks they're seeing dark matter, I, I suspect you would get money to build a second such detector <laughs> if it looks really good. And that second detector should see the exact same signal actually in phase, right? Because it's that same cosine. They're seeing that same background field. And you build it you know, somewhere else in the earth with maybe it could even be a totally different technology. There are multiple different techniques for looking for this kind of dark matter. Every different detector should see it. Um, same signal, same amplitude, same phase. Um, there's even actually further. So this is a great question. And, and we could go on and on about this. Let me not spend too much time, but, but there's further checks. I said the dark matter was oscillating with a, a, a unique phase, with, uh, sorry, with a unique frequency. It was only oscillating with frequency equal to the mass. Actually, that's not quite true. As I'm about to tell you in a second, the dark matter does have a little bit of kinetic energy. It is moving at this 10 to the minus three velocity, which meaning it has a, means it has a 10 to the minus six kinetic energy, 10 to the minus six of its mass. That actually gives a, a little 10 to the minus six width uh, to the, in the power spectrum, a, a little 10 to the minus six width in frequency space to the signal you're looking for. Uh, and you should be able to see that. Uh, you should you should be able to uh, at least in many cases observe for long enough to look for that. Um, so you should be able to see that sort of coherence time, see the properties of that signal. Um, uh, so so there's many things, and that's a very narrow signal to otherwise come from noise. <laughs> that by itself tends to indicate you know there's there's not much in nature that naturally has a Q of ten to the six. Um, so there's all those all those sort of checks. Um, anyway, okay, let me stop there. That's a great question. I could go on and on, but but did that answer the question or? Yes, perfectly. Um, I have another question, but maybe I'll save it for later. Uh, feel free to go ahead if you want. Or... All right. So, so we're looking for this bit of mass that results from the coupling with the dark matter field. So does that bit of mass uh, couple with the charge? I know it's dark and it must be dark. I don't know how dark it is, mm -hmm. but is there an effect of, on the charge? Ah, great question. So. Um, not with that particular operator that I wrote, but there absolutely is a different coupling, uh, a different type of coupling. And in fact, I'm going to get to that, actually. That's a great question um, in just like two slides. Uh, there's a different kind of coupling, which um, absolutely would cause oscillation of the charge, would cause oscillation, for example, of the fine structure constant. Um, and that's absolutely also something we can look for. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. Good. Yeah, yeah, great question.
Um, yeah, there's just a few of those. In fact, I'll get to those in, in just a couple of slides. Um, okay, great. Let me make sure I said what I wanted to say. Good. Okay, uh, one more thing you can do. Instead of comparing two of the same clock that are separated spatially, I could compare two different clocks that are co-located. And so long as they are um, looking at different sort of atomic energy splittings that depend differently on the electron mass. Actually, in this case, that, that's a little harder with the electron mass. So in this case, actually, I am going to the question um, he just asked. I'm, I'm going to one that actually couples to this charge E of the electron, OK? And if the, the two energy level splittings have different dependence on the charge of the electron, actually, that's usually only, if you think back to your atomic physics, that's only at subleading order, right? I mean, they all, all the energy splittings go like alpha, usually the leading order that we're using. But, um, but to subleading order, you can, you can get some difference. If you, so if I compare two co-located clocks, but they have a different parametric dependence on alpha, like one goes like alpha and one goes like alpha squared or whatever, there's a piece that goes like alpha squared. Then I can also pull out this same signal now, let's say oscillating the um, electron charge. And that would make these purple curves here, okay? And you can see they come in at much lower frequencies. These are much lower masses now. These gray are the background, um, uh, the, the constraints from uh, previous experiments, the, the current experimental constraints. And these, these blue are, again, these atom interferometer gravity wave detectors, actually a slightly different version of them. But you can see these come in at much lower frequencies, sort of complementary. And they, they do manage, these are actual experimental results and they do manage to stick out past current bounds, which is, which is pretty cool. And they um, will improve. Um, although it is true they're farther from the, the naturalness line um, by, because, uh, by virtue of being at lower frequencies. But, but you can also directly compare atomic clocks as well. Um, OK, so there's just sort of your first two examples, actually. Uh, two for the price of one there. First two examples of how to go looking for ultralight dark matter using this high precision um, quantum technology. OK, um, now uh, let me, one second, sorry. Um, whoops. Um, so let me see how much time I've got left. OK. Uh, so uh, we're, let, let, me, let me now um, shift gears and talk about um, all the different possible couplings of uh, the dark matter. And in particular, so I, I've showed you one, or actually I talked about two, the coupling to the electron mass and the coupling to the um, electron charge. There's actually a bunch of possibilities, but not uh, as sort of an infinity of possibilities, not as many as you might think. In fact, um, consistent with the sort of laws of effective field theory, the symmetries like Lorentz symmetry that we believe and gauge symmetry that we believe are, are good symmetries of our world, um, there aren't actually that many possibilities. Um, in particular, I said this ultralight dark matter has to be a boson. So it's either a scalar or a vector, right? And uh, we further like to break it down actually by its CP properties, its charge and parity conjugation. If you haven't seen it before, um, don't worry too much about this. It won't really be relevant for us, but, but we usually break it down into what's called a pseudoscalar, so CP odd, and a regular scalar, so CP even. And the pseudoscalar, by the way, uh, is also often what we mean by an axion. And the vector is broken down again into a, a CP even, an odd vector, an axial vector. Don't worry if you haven't seen those two names before. Um, but then for each of these cases, for example, for the classic axion case, there's only a few possible couplings. Um, it can couple to the field. This is the field strength F mu nu, the field strength of electromagnetism or of some other force like QCD. Actually, we, we, shouldn't, we couldn't look for it coupling to gravity or the electroweak force. So these are basically the only two examples that we can go looking for. Or it can have a, a derivative coupling like this. And I'm writing down quantum field theory operators. Don't worry too much if you don't understand it. I'll just sort of summarize for you what's going on. Coupling to, for example, electrons or nucleons, which would couple to the spin. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back to that one in just a second. Actually, I'll get back to both of these in just a second. Um, this, the scalar one, you can couple. Uh, don't worry too much about these operators. You can couple direct to properties of standard model like the electron mass or charge. Okay. And with a vector, actually, it's pretty similar. Um, uh, there are ones that couple to the spin. Uh, there are also ones that couple direct to electromagnetism. Here's a coupling of this new vector F prime, also labeled as A prime, direct to the field strength of electromagnetism, so direct to photons or electromagnetic fields. I'm going to talk about those in just a second. Um, this might look like a lot, but it's actually not too many. And we can sort of what's really cool is we can kind of cover all these possibilities. Um, this is something that's actually come out in, in recent years. There's been a lot of work actually by a lot of exciting work by a lot of theorists and experimentalists working together to figure out all the, all the ways to kind of use all these possibilities, because this is sort of the, the uh, uh, sort of semi-complete list of leading order couplings. 
first, if you're coupling to the electron mass or charge, or in fact, if you have a new like B minus L coupled gauge boson, a new, a new fifth force of nature that just directly pulls on your particles, um, this is the kind of thing I was just talking about. And you can look for it with atomic clocks, with gravitational wave detectors. And also, I didn't mention it, but also it just gives a force. The dark matter itself would actually tug with a force. Um, and you can look for it in, with accelerometers too, very high precision accelerometers. So, so those sort of experiments cover all of those couplings. Uh, then there are couplings like this, and, and I won't have time to go through all of them, sorry, um, but, but these couplings actually are, are all dominantly couplings to the spin of electrons or protons or neutrons. We're really good at looking at spin. Actually, I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but technologies like nuclear magnetic resonance, like atomic magnetometers, these are excellent measurements of the spin of particles, right? Spin, that's something physicists have played around with for a long time. It's not too surprising that we have some very high precision uh, uh, technologies for looking at the spins of these fundamental particles. And then finally, these last two types of couplings are couplings of the dark matter direct to electromagnetism, direct to, direct to E and B fields. We're good at manipulating E and B fields in the lab, right? We're excellent at making electromagnetic detectors, at making radios and microwave cavities and lots of things that, that magnetometers, things that sense E and B fields, right? So we can look for the dark matter um, through these couplings with those kind of detectors. And actually, this is, I won't mention it too much because you're actually going to hear a lot about this later in the workshop, I believe. A lot about, for example, looking for axions and I think hidden photons. Uh, uh, these vectors, I should say, are also called uh, hidden photons or dark photons um, through their coupling to electromagnetism. So I'll kind of just mention it briefly. Um, okay, but this is kind of an overview picture. So you can kind of see where we are. When, when I um, start picking particular couplings, like, for example, I was just talking about this coupling electron mass. It's not just a, a completely random choice in a, in a huge sea of possibilities. There aren't really that many, okay? And, and really for experimental ways of looking for things, there's kind of three broad classes of, of ways to go looking for this ultralight dark matter. So, so that's actually a really important kind of overview picture. Is that clear? Are there questions on that? Okay, excellent. So uh, let me see. Uh, good. What else I wanted to say? So um, let me, oops. Oh, and, and of course, the point was that that we, we think we can design experiments that can cover all of these um, possibilities. So I've, I've told you about some for this purple thing. I'm going to tell you briefly about a uh, possibility for the for the red, for the spin experiments. And then, uh, as I said, I'll basically leave it for later to talk about, for, for later lectures to talk about electromagnetic detection, which is actually a major field for looking for axions. Um, oh, sorry. Let me Let me not quite get to that yet. Okay, good. All right, so let me kind of now tell you um, uh, briefly about looking for um, ultralight dark matter axions or dark photons uh, through the coupling to spin, okay? How does this work? I showed you those couplings on the, on the previous slide. Um, uh, let me write it in terms of a Hamiltonian term, which you might be a little bit more familiar with. The term in the Hamiltonian, which would couple the dark matter to the spin of a particle, would again have some G, some, some dimensionful constant of nature, some coupling. I'm going to write it as axion, nucleon, nucleon, because I'm going to talk about the coupling of the axion to nuclear spin in this case, because we're good at looking for that. Ah, can't do that better. Um, and in this case, the Hamiltonian term actually couples the spatial gradient of the axion dotted into the spin of, say, the proton or neutron. Okay. Um, uh, now, let me just uh, step back for a second. So far, I talked about the axion field as if it was completely uniform. That's not exactly true. In fact, that little animated GIF I gave you wasn't just a uniform scalar field going up and down. It had sort of waves in it, right? The dark matter also must have waves in it. In fact, um, in another fact you sort of, if you, if you haven't seen it before, you should accept from quantum field theory is that uh, the spatial gradient of a field in quantum field theory is proportional to the momentum of that field, the spatial momentum, mv, okay? And actually then times the value of the field a, very roughly, this is sort of a rough um, proportionality, okay? The, remember the, the dot, the time derivative of the field gave you the kinetic energy. So maybe, maybe it's reasonable, maybe you can believe me that the space derivative gives you the momentum, okay? Um, or just accept it. <laughs> um, uh, Okay, so there actually is a spatial derivative, a spatial gradient to these dark matter fields. 
you can see it's basically um, uh, what we had before the value of this field, but, but down by this factor of 10 to the minus three of this velocity, which makes it a little harder to see, but we can still go looking for it. We have some excellent technology to look at spin. Um, okay, well, as a first example, all right, um, imagine I do something like the atomic clock or the atom interferometer. That, that's a really good sort of base case since we, since we developed it last time for understanding what's going on here. Um, but imagine, so let's imagine I start with my uh, atomic interferometer. By the way, this is kind of really basically the same thing that's going on in even in NMR and certainly in atomic magnetometers. Um, but now, in, remember, in, in the past, I've talked about starting with a, a ground, starting with the atom in a ground state and splitting its wave function into ground and excited, right? Super, superposition of ground and excited. What if I do a different beam splitter? I can do this too. What if I start with the atom in a spin up state? Okay, and then I have some beam splitter, which instead of splitting the internal energy level of the atom, splits the spin state, splits it into one over root two up plus down. Okay, and then I let that evolve in time. So think about that for just a second. What's going to happen? Let's say I have this background axion dark matter field. It's got this spatial gradient. It's got this coupling to the spin of, let's say, the nucleus of the atom or something. Let's say this is the nuclear spin, for example. Let's say I, I take that atom and I split it into this superposition state of up plus down. Okay. Uh, what's going to happen? So, in the interest of time, let me just tell you, which is let's imagine for simplicity first, let's imagine that let's say up is aligned with the direction of the axion gradient, the local gradient to the axion field and down is unaligned. Obviously, if it was just some angle, I would just add some cosine factor in here. Let me let me drop that, <laughs> okay? Um, but I can certainly look for this axion field at any angle. In fact, I, I certainly don't know this direction of the local spatial gradient to the axion field. I don't know what it is. The dark matter is flowing through me in some direction. I don't know what direction it is. By the way, I should say we call this coupling the axion wind coupling, uh, because it's proportional to the spatial gradient, which is the spatial momentum, that's the direction that locally the axion uh, field has momentum, is, is flowing in, that, the, that the, the momentum is moving in, OK? Um, but look, if, if one of these is more aligned and one of these is more anti-aligned with that direction, right, uh, then you can see that I'm going to get some uh, phase shift in my interferometer, right, which goes like, ah, uh, the phase shift, the, the signal, uh, phase shift signal in this interferometer is going to go like this delta E times the time, right? So, so for example, this up state might pick up as you, as you let it just sit and wait and evolve in time, it'll pick up some extra phase relative to this down state by whatever this energy splitting is of up versus down, okay? Is, is that clear? Are there questions on that? Okay, and what is this energy splitting? Well, I, I told it to you here, this is the Hamiltonian term, right? If this is spin up, I get like a plus sign in front. And if this is spin down, I get a minus sign in front. So it's basically just this up to order one factors. This is the size of the energy splitting, right? Is that clear? Okay, so, so the energy splitting is basically GANN times this grad A, okay, in size, uh, and then times the time, right? Uh, okay, great. Um, well, well, how big is that? Let me just give you some numbers. Um, so the uh, again, experiments set all, uh, existing experimental constraints set an upper limit on this GANN, uh, which is it has to be less than one over about ten to the nine GeV. This one has units, okay, and and we'll work in these particular units. Um, that's what's usually done. Uh, so you can see that this energy splitting delta E, which is about this GANN times grad A, uh, well, this is this GANN grad A, I said, was this uh, uh, 10 to the minus 3 for the velocity here times MA, right? Now, do you recognize MA, what that is? Think back. Where did it go? <laughs> Here it is. There it is. MA is just the square root of the dark matter energy density, right? Remember that? So that's actually very nice. This signal comes out independent of M. 
this signal just comes out to be 10 to the minus three times GANN times the square root of the local dark matter energy density, independent of the mass of the dark matter. Okay, so this signal size is not going to depend on the mass, although the frequency of this, this remember, this is an oscillating uh, energy shift, oscillating again at the frequency equal to the mass of the dark matter. Um, and for example, if I give you some numbers, okay, the final uh, signal phase shift, if I plug in, let's say this maximum uh, G here, uh, if I plug that in and I'll let you plug in the numbers and, and calculate, uh, you'll find a phase shift of about three times 10 to the minus eight. That's a dimensionless number that you would get. Uh, the square root of rho would come into en in energy units in the numerator, this GANN you notice has one over energy units, energy units in the denominator, they'd cancel, you get a dimensionless number. And of course, what that means is the number of radians of phase shift in your interferometer. Okay, I did that a little fast, but is that clear? Are there questions on that? Okay, um, great. Uh, and so then this would be how you look for it. For example, in an atom interferometer, or actually it's really the same signal. It, it's really the same thing you're looking for. If you're doing an atomic magnetometer, it really works very much the same way. I, I won't go into the details again, um, I'm, since, since I don't have time to, to go over that. Um, or also the same thing you look for um, if you're doing NMR. NMR is a sort of fancy resonant version of doing this kind of uh, um, atomic magnetometer, okay? And I won't talk about that, but that actually makes an excellent and very sensitive, the NMR detector actually makes a very sensitive experiment for axions in the lowest um, mass range. Okay, all right. So that was for this um, spin coupling. Now, that, that final third class of couplings um, was these electromagnetic couplings. Again, like I said, actually, those are going to be talked about later in the um, workshop, I believe. So I won't say too much except to sort of set up the, the picture for you to tell you kind of the, the, the big picture, um, which, as I said, if I, if I have this uh, scalar axion, it couples to electromagnetism. Uh, actually, the way it couples, um, uh, if you'll uh, permit me a, a potential term, uh, is the axion couples um, roughly like some G coupling. We usually call it GA gamma gamma, the coupling to two photons, coupling to E dot B, the electric and magnetic fields. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, therefore, if I build, for example, a classic experiment is to build a microwave cavity. If I place some big, ah, if I place some big background a magnetic field in it. Uh, then there's some background axion field. We usually illustrate it by a little dotted line. This is sort of officially a Feynman diagram. A background axion field coming in, uh, it could scatter off this background magnetic field and produce some electric field. You can sort of see that here. Or in other words, if I look in the equation of motion, if I have a background magnetic field and I have a background axion field, perhaps you can believe me that the equation of motion will, will source some new electric field. Or really, if you're in the cavity, it'll source some excitation of the cavity. In other words, a background magnetic field will let this term convert energy from the axion into the electromagnetic field in the cavity. It'll, the background axion will be dumping its energy into the electromagnetic cavity at a very low rate, of course. <laughs> so you need a very high precision, uh, a very high precision quantum sensor to, to pick it out, um, but you can. And in fact, it's not just microwave cavities, um, uh, also many other uh, electromagnetic uh, detectors um, for example, if you want to go to um, so sort of famous microwave cavity experiments, uh, look around the gigahertz frequency range or so for dark matter, and I think you'll hear about some more um, looking for a light through walls. If you want to look at lower frequencies, um, there are uh, uh, experiments using what are effectively LC detectors or like radios at lower frequencies. Um, and, and together, we think that electromagnetic detection can actually cover a lot of um, interesting axion parameter space. Uh, in particular, um, now, oh, sorry, one thing though I did want to mention, these experiments, uh, and it's actually classic for many axion experiments, I also mentioned a little bit with the NMR experiments, uh, these are resonant experiments, which means you pick a particular resonant frequency to set for your microwave cavity or for your LC detector, your LC oscillator, and then you have to slowly scan that because you're waiting when that resonant frequency hits the mass of the axion, hits the frequency of your background wave, that's when you resonate with it, right? That's when it starts dumping a lot of energy and not before. So you have to slowly scan that resonant frequency. And because of that, good, um, you, you get sensitivity curves that look sort of like this. So this is like these other sensitivity curves I've been showing you. Here's this coupling of the axion. This is now the electromagnetic coupling. 
versus the mass of the axion. Here's some previous limits. These, in this case, come from astrophysics. I, I won't go into that. Um, but these, these uh, curves down here are, are what we could go looking for. And, and all the way over here, this is all these microwave cavity experiments, uh, both existing limits in gray and, and future um, uh, work going on right now, experiments like ADMX um, and Haystack. Um, uh, down here at lower frequencies are these sort of LC circuit or lumped element detectors. Um, uh, I've been involved with DM radio, and um, there are these other detectors as well, Abracadabra and the LC circuit experiment. And we think together the microwave cavities and the, and the lumped element detectors can really cover a, a wide range of axion mass or frequency. Okay. Um, uh, are there any questions? So that was just a sort of really big picture overview. Okay. And you can see going many orders of magnitude past current limits, many orders of magnitude mass. So we're, we're very excited about these experiments. Um, uh, but I, I think you're going to hear some more about, in particular, how you could possibly drive the sensitivity down. You need very high precision, ultimately quantum sensors for both the microwave cavities. You need photon counters for the lumped element. You need high precision um, uh, quantum sensing that, you know, to, to, uh, to do back action evasion and things like that to, to really reduce the noise in your, um, in your magnetometers that are reading out these electromagnetic structures. So, so I won't go into any of that. I kind of just wanted to give you a, a preview, a brief idea. But but is the overall picture clear? Are there any are there any questions about this? Okay. And then the the very last thing I kind of wanted to tell you was I wanted to point out there is a um, there is a line I've drawn here that I've labeled the QCD axion. So so we were having a bit of a discussion yesterday. You remember I, I said I'm interested in looking over the whole dark matter parameter space. I think I think trying to cover as much as possible is really exciting, really important. This particular part of it, this kind of pinkish band is perhaps though a little extra motivated. And, and I would say it's got a little more motivation um, because it solves uh, this famous problem called the strong CP problem. So I wanna take just a, a couple minutes here and, and tell you that because I, I do think this is a worthwhile goal. And this is a lot of what these experiments are aiming to get to. You can see they cover a lot of interesting axion parameter space, but in particular, it's exciting that they can cover a bunch of the QCD axion parameter space. Um, so <clears throat> let me see if I can, oh, good. Um, so, so roughly, what is the strong CP problem? Well, it's that there is this um, allowed term in Lagrangian. Now, now again, if you don't speak um, QFT, don't worry. All this really means is this is the field strength of QCD of the strong force, and it has some dimensionless constant, dimensionless constant theta out front. Physically, this creates an electric dipole moment for the nucleon, which is this really small number here. It's really small, but we're really good at measuring electric dipole moments for the nucleon. Okay. So measurements have restricted theta to be tiny. And basically that's the strong CP problem right there. It should have existed. We should have seen an electric dipole moment for the nucleon a long time ago, but we didn't. Uh, it it's, it's, uh, uh, appears to be close to zero to nine digits. In fact, we, we've never seen it at all. So it may be much smaller than this. That's the strong CP problem. Actually, I should say, is, is that clear? I mean, that was a very quick introduction to the strong CP problem, but are there questions on that? That's the basic idea. Now, if, if, you're, if you're really uh, uh, memorized that table I showed you just recently, you may recognize this operator. This looks a lot like the coupling of the axion that I said the axion could couple to the strong force, sort of the same way it couples to electromagnetism. This G is the field strength of the strong force, very similar to the F mu nu of electromagnetism. Well, that actually, it's sort of beautiful. That is the axion solution. The, the axion is sort of probably the most famous or, or simplest solution to the strong CP problem. And the way it works is it just takes this would-be constant of nature, theta, and turns it into a field A, turns it into something dynamical, something that can move and change. I'm not going to tell you at all how this really works, but it picks up a potential which drives it towards zero. Okay, It danced down towards zero in the early universe, and that's what solves the strong CP problem. You turn it from a fundamental constant where you had no reason to think it should be close to zero to a dynamical variable, a field, something that could actually be influenced by dynamics, by potential, and in fact, it's sort of the magic, and this is what I haven't told you, gets driven towards zero, okay? But of course, there's some little residual oscillation of that field left, and that is the dark matter today. That is this axion field that we've been talking about. Okay, so, so that was sort of a lightning fast introduction to uh, the QCD axion there. Um, I just wanted to leave you with that. I, I won't talk too much more about QCD axion detection. Um, uh, hopefully you'll hear about it more, a little bit more in the school, or, or you can read about it more. But, but let me just sort of um, stop there and ask, are there any questions on this or on, on anything? Because I think the lecture is about over. Any questions on this or on anything that I've been uh, talking about?
can even stop my share. All right. Okay. So if you do have any questions later, um, um, you can put them in the in the Google Doc, and I'll try to answer them. Uh, but I think this was my um, my last lecture, so so I just want to say thanks, everyone. Uh, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> and uh, or, or by the way, I should say if, if you have any more questions for me, feel free to also send me an email. Uh, you can find my email. I'm at Stanford. Um, so so just send me an email. I'm I'm happy to answer. Um, thank you. Oh, sorry. I do see one. Is that a hand from Mackenzie? One question. We have yes. just a little bit of time. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Mackenzie, um, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, how does the damping down to zero work um, if the frequency um, gets to below uh, like a Planck scale? Ah, good. So actually, let me show that if this will load again. There we go. Okay, there's the potential. Um, uh, so the uh, um, uh, this axion damps down towards zero. Actually, the in fact, in fact, we did actually talk about it a little bit. Um, someone had mentioned. Uh, remember, we discussed that actually uh, this scalar field rolling back and forth in this in this quadratic potential like this does look like um, matter, and it redshifts like matter as the universe expands. To redshift like matter, remember the energy density goes like m squared a squared. The only thing that can happen as as the universe expands, the matter energy density must dilute, must get smaller. Remember that energy density is m squared a squared, so the amplitude a must damp, and that's all that's happening actually. It's sort of independent of the frequency of the axion. This uh, amplitude of the axion must damp because the universe is expanding, because the cold matter is is spreading out, is getting more dilute. Now I, I didn't actually prove to you that that's that's what actually happens, but I, I asserted that to you before. So at least uh, if you believe that, you can understand why this damps, and it and it really sort of independent of frequency. Uh, this this um, this uh, amplitude damps independent of frequency. Um, did, did that answer the question? Yeah, so yeah, I, I thought, I guess I thought the frequency was damping too, but that makes sense. No, good, thank you. That's a very important point, actually. I, I should have emphasized that this potential stays fixed and it really is just the spreading of the universe decreases this amplitude and that's it. Um, in other words, you know the potential stays fixed in a sense because the, um, the mass of the particle doesn't change. And then you have to have this connection between the mass, the potential and the, the red shifting, which I did not give to you, but, but I'm hoping you can accept. <laughs> great, that's a great question. Yeah, are, are there any other questions along that line? Um, all right, great. Well, well, thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure. And like I said, oh, sorry, one. Okay, one last question from from Ibrahim. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, it was it was kind of like last minute thing, but like you, you were saying, like the field mass um, remains fixed, therefore the frequency remains fixed. But like I'm thinking of the Lagrangian of like uh, of this scalar field, and there should be some interaction term with uh, whatever is in the primordial heat bath plus the mm -hmm. self-interaction of the field. And in that case, wouldn't uh, the field mass should be written as a function of time or temperature, which is like, which c contains this term of corrections. In that case, the, the frequency, wouldn't that change also? Uh, that's a great question. That's an advanced quantum field theory question. So, so for those of you who haven't done much quantum field theory before, just sort of you'll have to just accept what I'm about to tell you. That's a great question. And it would be true for any of the other couplings, but not for these axion couplings, which officially I didn't really go into it much, but but there's a, since it's a pseudo gold some boson, they're derivative couplings. It has a shift symmetry, which protects its mass. So, so those, if you haven't done field theory before, those, those words won't mean anything to you, sorry. But basically what that means, the axion is special. It's sort of unique. It does not get thermal corrections to the mass. Actually, as an aside, this is something we used recently to, to make an inflation model with an axion, but that's a complete tangent. Right. Um, it doesn't get thermal corrections. It doesn't get um, these density corrections, and it doesn't get self-energy corrections to its mass because it's protected by the shift symmetry. It's protected basically by being the Goldstone boson of the breaking of a, of a PQ symmetry from high energies. So that's a great question. It absolutely would have changed, but the axion is special. <laughs> uh, does that explain it? That's really interesting. Yes, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, no, it's pretty cool. Physics. It's just one of the main things that makes the axion work. So it's all hidden. I mean, I didn't go into the details of it at all because you really have to know field theory, but it's one of the things that makes the axion solution work. There is another raised hand by from Leonardo. Oh, great. Yes, thank you, uh, Leonardo. Yes, so uh, this is uh, maybe uh, sort of a question that does not have a definite answer. But uh, um, so, for example, uh, if there Existed dark matter that was not ultralight, but but light, 
such that it would be above the 10 EV uh, threshold or so, uh, in principle, that could scatter off of uh, atoms within an interferometer. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. has there been any work into looking to what extent such experiments are sensitive to more massive uh, dark matter candidates? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. There definitely has, um, uh, for sure. Um, it's it's tough um, uh, because once it's more like scattering, um, you're you're sort of worrying about the small energy depositions. But these are very sensitive experiments, so there there is maybe some hope to look for things like that. Um, and and actually, that since since you asked, I, I want to just advertise the um, uh, there was one small topic which I, I didn't get to cover, which is which is fine. It was sort of extra. Um, but but I'm excited about it right now because it's a paper I'm working on right now, um, so so uh, definitely new and and not actually out yet. I'm I'm hoping it's supposed to be out uh, next week. In fact, I was supposed to be writing it, but instead my uh, I wrote these lectures and my my postdoc is uh, <laughs> having to wait. Um, uh, we realized that you could kind of use these high precision, high sensitivity experiments like this, and in particular, uh, actually ion traps. Uh, you know, um, ion trapped ions are another um, uh, uh, very uh, promising technology uh, for quantum information, right? For quantum computing, because again, this technology that's really been able to be pushed by people to extreme limits, um, very high precision, you know, uh, very good control of the ion, uh, you know, could could make a good qubit. Um, so we realized actually you could use that uh, to look for exactly um, these kind of very low energy hits. It, it turned out in this case, it actually made a a good way to look for what are called millicharge particles, which for a, a whole different reason would be giving you very low energy hits. But let me just sort of advertise that. Um, yes, I, I think there's probably lots of ideas. And in particular, I think there's lots of ideas that we haven't had yet. <laughs> so that's a great question. And let me turn it around and ask all of you to think about that. Um, I think there's probably lots of new ways to exploit these high precision technologies to go looking for new things like dark matter in that intermediate mass range or in any heavier or lighter mass range or other kinds of new physics. So, so let me kind of leave that as a challenge for all of you. You can think about that as you go through the rest of the lectures in the school. Um, how, can we, how can we use uh, any of these techniques? How can we exploit them to, to look for dark matter or any kind of fundamental physics? So anyway, let, thanks. <laughs> let me sort of leave it at that. Um, okay, great. Well, well, thanks all. Um, if I don't see any more questions, then, then it was a pleasure. And uh, do feel free to email me or anything um, with extra questions. Thank you, Peter, so much. It has been great to have you as a teacher, as a lecturer. Great lectures. So thank you so great. much for taking part in this school.